G'day ladies and gents, and welcome back to War Thunder. Welcome to the new update, Update Direct Hit, where we have a few more direct hits in the form of the Skyflash missile. This is essentially an upgraded AIM-7E2 and is found on the uh, FG-1 and the FGR-2. Today we're going to be having a look at the FG-1, but not before we have a quick word from our sponsor. It's sponsored by Opera GX. This video is sponsored by Opera GX. If you've been following the channel over the last year, you'll be familiar with Opera GX and it's quite frankly insane level of customization and actually useful features set, particularly for those people running potato PCs or for those with potato internet. My personal favorites include the internet bandwidth limiter, which I actually used to use before I had decent internet so I could keep watching live streams while my videos uploaded overnight. Opera GX's feature set includes integrations with social media platforms such as Facebook, VK, Twitter and more which allows quick access to your social media sites without the excess of tabs. It is also compatible with Chrome extensions such as BTTV so you can keep your better Twitch TV emotes. Feels good man. Opera GX allows you to completely customize your browser's look, including custom animated wallpapers which look great, custom color themes, forcing of dark modes which is really really nice and handy pop-out video windows, compatibility with Razer Chroma, and more. If you're worried about losing your saved passwords and bookmarks when you make the switch to Opera GX, don't, because Opera has a quick and handy quick import tool which makes the switching even easier. The amount of development Opera offers for you and your browsing experience for both low-end potatoes, mega high-end rainbow unicorn vomit PCs, and now even mobile speaks volumes about Opera's commitment to an excellent product. Give it a try, support the channel, download Opera in the description below. It's completely free and quite honestly, it is an excellent product. Opera GX has been my default browser now for about a year and maybe it could be yours too. Try it, you might just like it. Thank you to you, the viewer, for supporting Opera GX and of course, thank you to Opera GX for sponsoring this video. So the FG1 is essentially the same thing as the FGR2 in War Thunder at least, I believe there are some subtle differences, but do let me know in the comments section below. If you see a British Phantom, treat it the same way, because they're practically the same thing. Now, uh, but as we're taking off, I just want you to have a look at the sides near the afterburners, near the engines, and how there were those two little things that closed. I'm not really sure what they are, but I would love to know what they are in the comments section below. Let me know, of course, that would be wonderful. So, the FG1 and the FGR2, both, both with their Pulse Doppler moments, have a new toy to play with, and that is the Skyflash missile, which is quite a shade more impressive than the AIM-7Es. Now, this is a pretty significant upgrade, but does it really change everything? You see, a missile is only about as good as its radar, and whilst the radar on this plane is fantastic, it's a pulse Doppler radar, of course, the plane that carries the radar also matters. Can you point that radar in the right direction? can the, the radar go quicker than its opponents? Essentially, do the avionics make up for its lackluster performance? And I don't know, I don't really know how I, how I feel about this. The FG-1 is a very heavy Phantom, I think it's based on the F-4K, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, I always get it mixed up, but basically this thing is a thick boy and is a very, very fat Phantom. So you're not going to be turning against any other Phantoms, and we are going to see that in some gameplay of the uh, FG-1 later on in the video. But basically what I'll be looking for here are some juicy targets. Anything that might be of interest to me that I can potentially sort of swoop in on and take quite easily. Um, FJ-1, FJ, FJ-4, that, that thing, it exists, but now it doesn't exist anymore because the A5C just gave it a match of magic. So I'm just basically going to be looking for targets here. I'm not really uh, giving myself a bit of a plan. I am technically down tiered, so there are a lot of 10.0s in this match. So hopefully I can pick up one or two of them. And I do spot there a MiG-21. He is quite low, and in my opinion, he's a little bit slow. So you know what? I'm going to say screw it, and I'm going to chase after him. Prep a 9G and have a look at the, uh, the bo I think it's the bore site, the, the outer circle there. It's massive, so it gives you a lot of options there for uh, sort of offsets. But you can also slave these to your radar, and of course the Pulse Doppler radar is an excellent radar. So you have plenty of options there. Thankfully the MF was not paying attention at all, and now he pays a repair cost. So that's a bit of a W for me, and now I go on to find my next victim here. 
Hopefully I can use the sky flashes in the form of a dogfight, but honestly a lot of people are starting to get used to the idea that a uh, dogfight missile, as in the sky flash, is uh, potentially on its way if a British Phantom heads to straight towards you. Now this F4E here has played a smart move and he's gone for the head-on missile as well. They get the AIM-7E2s, which are quite a lot better than the regular AIM-7Es. They are just a nice little upgrade there and of course being a little bit too ambitious there with your AIM-7Es or your, your um, sky flashes rather uh, can result in uh, no missile heading to the target. So I'm just again looking for other targets that I can potentially sky flash and it seems like the J35D here looks like a prime candidate for an AIM-9G. You want to be able to use these AIM-9Gs quite uh, sparingly or basically you use them whenever your opponent is heavily distracted and is about two or three kilometers away and is generally subsonic. You don't really want to be using it for any of the other sort of uh, high angle type attacks and anything traveling beyond the 1100. I probably wouldn't even bother with the AIM-9G because it's just so damn fast. So speaking of fast, we have a very rapidly deteriorating situation here where the F4E here is looking for a little bit of a juicy head on. Unfortunately, he decides to come in to me at the last minute and therefore pays the price. And the JA37 here is looking like he's in a little bit of trouble. I might need to switch to the sky flashes here and it looks like I will. Missile away and of course straight into the JA37 who's not paying attention to me. These missiles are really, really strong when you are in a situation where your opponent is not paying attention and are heading roughly towards you. You can come in from above or you can come in from uh, semi-side. You don't want to be coming in at the direct side of your opponent because then they'll be able to notch you, meaning that the Pulse Doppler radar will essentially uh, not be able to detect that your opponent is there. Because the way a Pulse Doppler radar works is it works by... Uh, if you remember from high school physics, if you took it, uh, redshift. Basically, it is looking for a change in the pattern against the ground clutter. And so if you can kind of mimic the ground clutter and sort of head left to right, then the pulse doppler radar doesn't think you're there. It doesn't know that you're there. Uh, and that's kind of the only way to really get your hands away from these sky flash missiles. These things are very, very powerful too. So it's not like you can just sort of dodge them. Well, you can, but you have to be pretty fast and you are going to sacrifice a fair bit of speed. It's kind of like one of the uh, maybe AIM-9Gs, similar to an AIM-9D in terms of its turning performance. But you've got to remember that the AIM-9s and the AIM-7s are kind of apples and oranges. One of them is quite light and one of them is quite heavy and long range. So if the AIM-7 makes a turn, then it's going to bleed a lot more speed than an AIM-9 will, but it will also have a lot less range. So just consider that when you're thinking about AIM-9s and when you're thinking about AIM-7s, consider that one of them is a chunky monkey and the other one is a little bit nimble, but is uh, shorter ranged. So our last victim here is going to be this A7. The A7 is definitely an attacker now that it is at its 10.0 uh, BR. I know a lot of people got a little bit salty at me for saying that it should be at 10.0, but personally, I think that that is a good spot for it. Anyway. A7D manages to break the lock by notching, which is very, very clever, but unfortunately he's too slow, and uh, yeah, not really much left for the A7D over there. Uh, and of course, it is pretty much game over with that being said. This plane does not really like having uh, one on multiple enemies. You need to be in the wolf pack, and you need to be sort of one on three, or two on two, or three on three. And that's when this plane really starts to shine. It's one of those planes that you just can't put in a 1v1. If MiG-21s had their way with this plane, it would be dead very, very quickly because the MiG-21s are good at those one versus ones. Whereas a plane like the FGR-2 is really, really good in those plane in those situations where it's like a 3v3 or a 4v4. And we kind of will see this in the next match here. And uh, moving on swiftly after that absolute disaster of a final match, I suppose. So, again, I'm pulling out my post pulse doppler, I'm making sure that I have a bit of option here for uh, speed and a little bit for altitude. I don't want to hug the ground too close because I have found that the pulse doppler radar will not give you an all red or an all green for the uh, for the missile, to, for it to fire basically. But you do have plenty of options when it's a little bit higher. And of course you can always burst up to your opponents. I probably wouldn't be sitting at deck level, but maybe if you climb a little bit then that surely doesn't hurt. I wouldn't be sitting in space of course, because in space 
everyone will see you uh, and no one will hear you scream so definitely don't go up too high because you'll be basically food for everyone else with a radar I would probably stick to these lower altitudes maybe go up as high as 3,000 4,000 meters but I would probably leave it at that now I am tracking a target here and my prim primary goal here is to just see what he does if he's going to start to notch me then I'm not going to bother I'm not even going to be interested but if he is going to just head straight towards me blindly then that means he's either not paying attention or doesn't have RWR I do see a missile coming out from the distance here and maybe I can uh, get myself a cheeky little kill of course I'm ignoring the targets that are uh, going off to the side of me simply because I need to concentrate on what's ahead and if I turn around I'm going to bleed all of my speed now this target here turns out to be a J35D and it turns out that the J35D doesn't have RWR so uh, yeah not really a great show for the uh, J35 but um, I guess that's my kill and yoink my plane now goodbye so we're going to move on we're having a look at the situation that is uh, panning out here on the battlefield and I'm going to basically try and make myself as useful as possible I'm keeping my head on a swivel as much as I can because I know the spotting system has been failing me lately and it has been pissing me off so I really don't want to throw away another good opportunity to get some kills the uh, JA-37 down there is looking pretty juicy, but is not really a great target because he's basically covered by the clouds. So I don't want to go after him because I'm basically just going to just just follow him and uh, have to go through the clouds. But the F-4E here was in the same boat until about 10 seconds ago. So I guess pick one, maybe I'll get the kill. And the FGR-2 below me decides that he's going to take the F-4E. E, so I'm not going to waste a missile, I'm going to try and pull in for the JA-37 here. A little bit of a burst and it is a really nice connection there with a critical hit and he goes straight down. Passing by that F4E there is uh, pretty risky bisky and the J35D below me is looking also like a juicy target so I think I'm going to prop, prep an AIM-9G for the J35D and maybe if the F4E comes back we'll see what he does then. I'm just going to have a quick squiz at what the FGR-2 does, make sure he doesn't get ca caught up by the missile, and uh, send one briskly on its way. At this speed, there is really no avoiding this missile. Even with flares, I would guess that uh, it would be a pretty hard ask to uh, get away from a missile like the A9G. The 9Gs are quite good, and I think that is a very, very welcome change over the 9Ds, especially being able to be slaved to the radar. Now, speaking of radar, we are ready for another pulse doppler moment here. JA-37 not looking and uh, not paying attention. Only at the last minute does he realize that he's going to be killed by a sky flash, and so he makes a wise decision to skedaddle out of there. F4E here, and a uh, JA-37 again. We've basically got ourselves a 4v3 or a 4v2. The F4E here is heading straight back towards me for a head-on. So what I'm going to do is send a sky flash all the way down, lead it a little bit, and it makes a beautiful connection because the F4E is just too damn slow. As I see the battle panning out here, the F104 is not really looking in a good situation. So I'm going to come and try and save him, but unfortunately he does manage to, uh, well, he does kick the bucket. And the J37 now turns his attention to me, so I turn my sky flash towards him and get myself a nice kill, briskly avoiding the F4E, or the F4F rather. Now, this is where it starts to get a little bit hairy. I thought I might try my luck and see because I know the F4F carries some uh, wing slats and so if it's going to turn it's going to bleed a lot of speed and so I try this weird technique where I'm going to try and rope a dope him but we're pretty much in the territory now where it is looking extremely hairy for me and I have severely miscalculated the rope dope so I've got my gear out I've got everything wrong I've pretty much royally goofed this up and I need someone to save me and this is what I mean by 1v1s are not good for the FG1 and the FGR2, but I tell you what, a 2 versus 2 or a 2 versus 1 is a perfect situation, and that's what I'm banking on here. The F4F here being pretty much uh, dumb enough to follow the FGR2, so I can get myself a nice little kill. And uh, he's kind of taking the bait, he's kind of working into that, and I've just switched my afterburner off so that I can get a little bit more turn in, not to make myself slower, well, kind of to make myself slower, but uh, not to give myself less energy, but more sort of to lower my speed so my turning circle is cut short. However, in a dogfight, this could potentially be a little bit nasty. So, the F4F has realized that he's royally screwed up and he's starting to pop flares, and the 9G 
does love its flares, it does sort of eat them up a lot, and so he can basically just get a nice big serving of 20mm fire. I don't think I've ever held the trigger down on the uh, 20mm for that long, but you know what, it got me the kill. <laughs> it got me the kill, it was the last kill of the game, and it gave me kill number 6. So, I'm very very pleased with that match. But in saying that, the FG-1 is still a bus. It is still a missile bus. So you need to make sure that when you play the F-4F, uh, sorry, when you play the FG-1, you don't get yourself into a situation with an F-4F like that. Don't turn, so stick to your 2v2s, and enjoy Phantom. your post Doppler moments. Video. That plane has been really, really heavily requested for a long time, but I just don't know why people want to see it. It's, it's pretty much the same as the Phantom... FGR2, and of course, now that it gets the sky flashes, I thought today might be a really good way to show it off. As you can tell, we've been in lockdown for a fair amount of time, no hairdressers, so you know what? Can't really complain. Of course, I also can't complain about today's sponsor, which is Opera GX. Thank you very much again to Opera GX for sponsoring the video. These guys help me out a lot, and as you can see, I'm currently transitioning between air cooling, all-in-one liquid cooling, and custom loop water cooling. So um, I'm just waiting on a couple more things. Going to get some fans, going to get a sensor, and we can pretty much start with custom water cooling the CPU. I'm going to leave the GPU until I get an RTX 3000 series, or God forbid, having to wait till RTX 4000, because of course I do need the shadow plate for recording, and <laughs> my God, it is going to be one hell of a long journey. But uh, Opera GX and you guys, of course, through supporting the channel, through Patreon, Air Models, sponsors, Twitch, you name it, you guys have helped sponsor or bring this channel to uh, sort of what it is today. So thank you very much for that and more content to come very, very soon.